Well, good evening. Let me invite you to come on in and find a seat. It is my pleasure to be able to welcome you all to this 42nd annual Winifred E. Wheater Lecture for Meritorious Scholarship. The Wheater Annual Faculty Award Lecture was established in 1975 to honor Dr. Winifred Wheater in the year of her retirement after 40 years of service as an SPU professor. The endowment to support this scholarship was given by another SPU emeritus professor, Ross Shaw, and it's still funded in part by Ross's Memorial Fund. The Wheater Lecture, and this is the quote, provides a public platform from which the claims of the liberal arts in the Christian university are espoused. Each year, a faculty member is chosen by the faculty status committee to receive this honor and to present, quote, scholarship informed by a Christian worldview. I myself never had the chance to meet Winifred Weeder, although I know that many of you in this room did have that chance, heard many wonderful stories. She earned her doctorate in 1933 from the University of Chicago. And she was one of the few Seattle Pacific faculty members at the time to have a doctorate. And she later admitted that a young lady with a brand new unused PhD was pretty special. <laughs> so special that with her PhD in classical literature, she was initially hired by Seattle Pacific to teach a PE class. <laughs> but she quickly set to work creating a new class and eventually a new department for classical languages and over the next 40 years, her passion for Greek and Latin would inspire thousands of students. Dr. Weider was also Seattle Pacific's first female coach, leading athletic programs for over a decade. And her great love of teaching and her devotion to this institution left really an indelible mark on a whole generation. I think I would be remiss if I did not note one of her better qualities. Uh, she modeled this. It, it set a trend that apparently never caught on, but was nonetheless quite admirable. Apparently, given her father's prominent position with a leading law firm, she regularly returned back to the university her paycheck. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> this lecture is a wonderful tribute to Dr. Weider's 40 years of service, and I'm quite confident that if she was here today, as she was actually at each lecture from 1975 to 2001, that she'd be thrilled with tonight's presentation. So let me welcome the Margaret to the podium to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Provost Van Duzer. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to uh, give a couple of shout outs here before we start. One to Jen Wilson and Michelle McFarland and to the Falconettes who help us organize and execute this event. Um, tonight, we have the special pleasure of hearing from one of our distinguished School of Theology faculty members, Dr. Daniel Costello. His title is he's a professor of dogmatic and constructive theology. Um, I'm not exactly sure what <laughs> dogmatic and constructive theology are, but I'm hoping that Daniel can maybe explain that during the Q&A. It's a true honor to introduce Dr. Costello to you this evening. He is what we in the business refer to as a triple threat. He's an exemplary teacher and scholar, and he's a dedicated university servant. Daniel is also our incoming fearless leader, our faculty chair-elect. He has chosen to highlight the theme of scholarship at our annual faculty retreat in September, which reveals his heart and passion for scholarly pursuits. In anticipation of giving this introduction, I went through Daniel's Vita and attempted to summarize all of his various accomplishments. But I only have two minutes, so it's not possible to even scratch the surface in two minutes, so I'm just going to highlight a few. Daniel is an ordained elder in the Pacific Northwest Conference of the Free Methodist Church, and he enjoys teaching and preaching in the local church. He is a prolific author, including book titles such as Confessing the Triune God, Holiness is a Liberal Art, Theological Theodicy, Hosea, Two Horizons Old Testament Commentary, Revisioning Pentecostal Ethics, and my personal favorite, Pneumatology, A Guide for the Perplexed. <laughs> Professor Costello will be speaking to us tonight on a matter of urgency. The world is our parish, struggling with Catholicity in our Western context. 
He poses the question for us, what would be involved for Western Christians to change course and truly believe as they confess that they are part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Let's listen closely, reflect, and be edified, challenged, and convicted by what Daniel has to say to us this evening. Daniel? To the administration, staff, faculty, and students of the SPU community, as well as esteemed friends and guests. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be the 2017 Weeder Lecturer. I appreciate this award very much in that it emphasizes that a place like this one, the Liberal Arts University, is one where unique perspectives and contributions can be generated, not simply for the church, but really for the whole of academia. Professing Christian scholars have something to say, and I'm very grateful for a venue like this one in which some of those things can be presented to a wider whole. To begin, let me elaborate the title of this lecture. As some of you may have noticed, the title of the world is our parish, is an allusion to a famous quote of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Wesley was very quotable in his lifetime, and one of those quotes one may know of is the following claim he made, the world is my parish. Now a little background to this Wesley quote. One finds it in a journal entry by Wesley dated Monday, June 11th, 1739. This journal entry had a copy of a letter written to a James Hervey, and in this letter we find the quote in question. For the sake of context, this is roughly one year, about one year, after Wesley's famous Aldersgate experience, in which his heart was strangely warmed. People typically know that one. And a few months after he began the scandalous activity of open air field preaching. The question that Wesley was addressing through the quote is the propriety of his preaching in the context of parishes other than his own. There's a rule about this registered by the Council of Nicaea and repeated within the ordinances of the Church of England. Basically, the issue was that this activity was improper, a stepping on other people's toes kind of gesture. Nevertheless, Wesley felt bound by a higher authority to heed the call to preach the gospel and felt justified in doing so on scriptural grounds. As he reasoned, quote, God in scripture commands me according to my power to instruct the ignorant, reform the wicked, confirm the virtuous. Man forbids me to do this in another's parish. And he continues, whom then shall I hear God or man. He quotes Paul from 1 Corinthians to the tone of, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. He quotes other biblical passages and finally adds, suffer me now to tell you my principles in this matter. I look upon all the world as my parish. Thus far I mean that in whatever part of it I am, I judge it meet, right, and my bounden duty to declare unto all that are willing to hear the glad tidings of salvation. And then he goes on and says, this is the work which I know God has called me to, and sure I am that his blessing attends it. As you can see, Wesley's original phrase was a manner of justifying Wesley's ministry in the light of it being unconventional in a certain way. The appeal is made to scripture and to divine command, no less. After all, how can honoring human custom stand up to heeding God's call? But let us press at a deeper level here. Implicit in this Wesley quote is a particular understanding of world. 
Also implicit in this quote is a particular self-understanding by Wesley of his own agency. Put generically, the self is called to make an impact on the world. The world is standing as an open field, in this case figuratively and literally, ready to be influenced by the agency of a single self. I dare say that a similar interplay of self and world could also be at work in the second half of our institutional motto, namely changing the world. Now let me say from the onset that this understanding of both self, the self's agency, and of the world has generated a number of positive contributions. People like Wesley have throughout Christian history sacrificed immensely for the cause of Christ by stepping into unknown or unpredictable circumstances to profess the gospel. Christianity operates out of a mission-oriented ethos, one that is registered in a number of biblical passages. One of the most prominent, of course, is the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Personally, I should add, I've benefited from this kind of approach since my family on my father's side came to faith because of the special call felt and heeded by a woman by the name of Maria Atkinson. Uh, Maria Atkinson was, was a personality, and uh, her tombstone uh, shows that. She says, she has listed there, no doubts here awaiting the resurrection. <laughs> Isn't that great? Uh, it's just, uh, she, was, she must have been something. I, I didn't know her personally, but uh, she was something from the stories that I've heard. So I've benefited from this kind of approach since my family on my father's side came to faith because of the special call that she had. The Spirit used Sister Maria powerfully, and I trace part of my Christian lineage back to her. I'm grateful for her obedience to the call of God in her life to, in a sense, look at the world as her parish. And yet, this understanding of the self and the world is not innocuous. In fact, it can be funded by quite a bit of difficult assumptions. The understanding needs to be chastened by the crucifying and transformative power of the gospel. That I say this already gives way to a fundamental commitment of mine that I need to spell out from the onset. And this fundam fundamental commitment is this. When people come to Christ, when they are converted to the gospel, and also when they are commissioned by the Spirit to do the work of God, they do not start at ground zero, so to speak, in terms of culture and identity. This is what is potentially problematic about the first part of our institutional motto, engaging the culture. As it was recently noted publicly by a fellow colleague at an in-service event, originally that part of the motto may have been used so as to show that SPU is not sectarian. And this is a very plausible thesis and it makes good sense as to the phrase's early appeal. But there's a fundamental reality at work here that may go unnoticed. All of us are already engaged by culture before we even begin to think of exercising our agency to engage it. Put more directly, culture pre-exists our agency. In fact, culture may determine how we see our agency, if we see it at all, and how we go on to exercise it if we exercise it at all. These matters, I believe, ring true of the Christian life more generally. Before we exercise our agency as Christians heeding the call of Christ, we are already conditioned by our wider surroundings in very important ways. Again, take Wesley as an example. <laughs> Pre-Aldersgate and post-Aldersgate, Wesley was English, an Englishman. And to understand Wesley well in all facets of his life, including his ministry and theology, one has to account for his English environment, his English accent, so to speak. And this is the case for each one of us as well. Given that most of us in this room are Westerners, we have to take into account and wrestle with our own Western context and culture. 
including its history and legacies, especially as we start to think about both our agency and our understanding and engagement with the world. Why? Because again, there are features of this environment and conditioning that need chastening by the crucifying and transformative power of the gospel. If left unchecked, these tendencies have the potential to put us in very troubling circumstances. And maybe these will shape and form us in problematic ways. Perhaps the most troubling outcome of such a situation is the way we may be inclined to make a case for Christ in an unchristlike way. But another outcome, one that I wish to stress this evening, is that perhaps this conditioning and shaping make it difficult for us to understand ourselves as somehow part of the global church. It should not be a secret anymore that Christianity is currently going through a massive growth spurt. Over the last few decades, Christianity has flourished tremendously throughout the world, especially on the continents of Africa and Asia. And I've compiled some stats for you. This is from a Pew Research Center document that just came out in 2015. And it's estimated that in 2010, with a global population of about 7 billion, that 2.2 uh, billion of those 7 billion uh, were Christians. Of those 2.2 billion, 1.35 billion are said to be a non uh, North American and non European Christians. So that means around 61% of the total of the 2.2 billion uh, would be non uh, North transatlantic uh, populations. Now I look at the projections for 2050. So we it's projected that we would have a global population of 9.3 billion. And again, the projection is that global Christians would be about 2.9. Notice how many more Christians now from the whole would be non-North American and uh, European Christians. 2.2 billion, or around 76% of the total. So just to put those side by side, you can see uh, a certain kind of trajectory taking place. Um, Christianity is a perhaps a different religion than we might imagine based on these kinds of statistics and these kinds of trajectories. We Christians can praise our God for these developments, but we should also be mindful about these dynamics. To be a Christian now, and even more so in the future, is to be part of a global religion in which the transatlantic world, that is North America and Europe, is becoming less and less of a visible presence. In other words, most of the world's present and future Christians don't look like most of us in this room, don't speak like most of us in this room, they don't think like most of us in this room, and quite possibly on a number of levels, they may just not believe in the Christian faith like most of us in this room. With these developments at work in the world today, how are most of us in this room then to engage and be part of these developments given our identity as Westerners? How can we make the claim that the world is our parish in such a way that it does two things? First, that it accounts for cultural legacies stemming from our own environment that potentially taint our way of making sense of our agency and of the world. And second, that it stresses in a fundamental way something generative about what it means to be Christ's body, the church. As a strategy to make headway on these matters, let me elaborate and expand upon two different notions, both of them beginning with the letter C. Alliteration's always nice, isn't it? The first will aim to account for the cultural legacies that potentially make it difficult for us to claim properly the world is our parish. And so this first theme I'm labeling Constantinianism. The last C, will aim to account for how we as Westerners and those of us who are Christians can be in solidarity with a global reality and a global church. The second theme I will call Catholicity. My argument this evening is that by exposing and elaborating these two terms, we can think anew about what it would mean for those of us who are Westerners and those of us who are Christian to claim the world as our parish. And perhaps it may just alter how we inhabit and understand our institutional claim 
of engaging the culture, of changing the world. So let's move to the first point, this being Constantinianism. What does it mean, and what is its legacy for us today? Constantinianism has as its reference Emperor Constantine, or sometimes called Constantine the Great, who was in power within the Roman Empire during the years 306 to 337. Now, there's a lot that could be said about Constantine. Much of his life and legacy are debated significantly, uh, in part because we have competing accounts from antiquity. Questions that continue to plague scholars are, did he convert to Christianity? If so, where and when? What kind of conversion was it? The most famous account related to these questions is the vision he and his soldiers allegedly had right before the Milvian Bridge in 312, a vision that included light, a cross, and a voice. But differing testimony exists, and other questions include, if he was a Christian, what kind of Christian was he? He certainly was ambitious, and throughout his reign, he did some terrible things. And yet, by his own account, he used Christian language. When speaking to bishops, he included first-person plural language, such as our Lord and our God. He started using Christian symbols on coins and military and regal equipment. He encouraged bishops to press toward Christian unity. And he was able to articulate quite proficiently, I would say, the outcomes at the Council of Nicaea as these were opposed to Arianism. So what we have here is a very, very complex person and legacy. But I do want to draw a distinction between the man Constantine and the term Constantinianism. Given the complexity of Constantine's life and legacy and how these are significantly disputed, our goal tonight is not to enter in all of the details. But I also want to add here that Constantine's life and legacy are not altogether bad. I want to nuance this a little. When you compare what was happening to Christians under the reign of Diocletian and how they were treated under Constantine, both within the early fourth century, I think we would all prefer Constantine. Uh, Diocletian and others within the Roman Tetrarchy targeted Christians in a terrible, horrible way. Each situation had its problems. And whereas Constantine would probably be preferred to Diocletian in the eyes of most Christians, Constantine is not without his own challenges. And some of these challenges I'm trying to highlight with the word Constantinianism. Constantine for us tonight is a symbol that yields a concept we can term Constantinianism. The symbol and the concept relate to how Western political power and Christian religious power are actively brought together in a mutually supporting relationship. Now, interestingly, the roots of this process go, go back before Constantine. The Roman Empire broadly thought of itself as relying upon religious powers and symbols prior to Constantine. In fact, some say that this arrangement is what significantly led to per Christian persecution by the Roman Empire prior to Constantine, for Christians would not perform the mandated sacrifices that many believed were necessary for Roman political power in order to be at work and effective. But interestingly, with Constantine, it seems that Christianity was brought into this broader arrangement. Now, rather than Jupiter or some other god, the Christian god was brought in. The proof was in the pudding, so to speak. Constantine was quite successful militarily and politically once he made the switch of giving honor to the Christian God at around 312. Maybe that's why Constantine was so worried about Christian unity. He did not want a fractured church because this could incite the wrath of the Christian God, both upon the church and possibly upon the empire. It seemed that honoring and fearing the Christian God had political ramifications for Constantine, and that is why he is symbolic of a new relationship between the Roman Empire and the Western Christian Church, a relationship that has shifted, changed, mutated, and one that is still with us today in a certain way. As such, Constantinianism is a particular problem of Western Christianity, one that has its origins with Emperor Constantine, but has evolved significantly over the centuries. Constantine's arrangement was one thing. The Holy Roman Empire in medieval Europe was another. 
the German and English Reformations were another. Even in our American context in which the separation of church and state is official in some sense uh, is another such case. Each of these examples is unique and has a number of different factors to account for in its own terms. And yet there is a running theme in all of these cases, which is that Western political identity and Western Christian religious identity are connected somehow, officially or unofficially. So in one arrangement, it might mean that to be a citizen and to be a Christian are conflated identities in the eyes of a region or country, whether both of these are actively taken up by each individual in said country or not. In another arrangement, the separation of church and state can be affirmed at the same time that the state is referred to as a Christian nation, as founded on Christian principles, and as political elections are significantly determined based on identified Christian themes or stances on hot topic issues. Constantinianism therefore comes in different shapes and sizes, but it is a legacy marking the Western consciousness. And if we are Westerners, and if we are Christians, its legacy marks our own consciousness as well. I should also say that Constantinian, Constantinianism is at the background of two other seas loosely that have manifested themselves in Western history. So uh, that's the theme here that I've been stressing. The Crusades. When the Crusades began in the latter part of the 11th century, it was very clear that Constantinian frameworks were at play. The call to liberate a foreign land such as Jerusalem through the use of military violence because it was narrated as God's will. The elaboration of such activity as a pilgrimage of sorts to secure some kind of penance. The casting of death on the battlefield as a kind of martyrdom. The preparation of soldiers through the sealing of the cross. These and many more details show a significant and complex interplay between religion and culture, between spiritual and political power. The Crusades offer a devastating example of how the relationship between the self and the world can be cast when religious and cultural factors come together. In many ways, the Crusades are but one indicator of just how vast and gripping Constantinianism has been in the Western consciousness. The other C I have in mind that is an offshoot of Constantinianism and may be related to the Crusades is colonialism. Now Westerners, of course, not invent colonialism, but it's quite startling to note how much of what we understand to be colonialism today is touched by Western activity. To be clear, colonialism can be understood as a kind of twisted relationship between two groups of people in which one group conquers and controls another people's territories and goods for some aim, for some kind of gain. It is said by the 1930s, close to 85% of the globe's land surface was touched by some form of colonialism. And this largely represented by Western powers such as the British, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Portuguese, and so on. Our own American context has a long history of colonialism too. And one significant chapter is the way First Nations and Native peoples were displaced, treated, and affected as a result of Westerners settling and expanding into their territories. Another significant chapter is chattel slavery, as we understand it on the American scene, which is very much driven by the colonial machine. And there are other chapters too, including the Mexican-American War, the status of Puerto Rico, the various effects stemming from the Monroe Doctrine, and so on. So how's colonialism tied to Constantinianism? In Western history, the tie is detectable in the way religious leaders and religious authorities oftentimes sanction colonizing efforts and tendencies. The matters are quite complex and nuanced, but it should be said that in some cases, the violence and pillage was said to be justifiable when the other could be deemed as heretical, barbaric, pagan, anti-Christian, or anti-God. Again, when, many, when cases like these presented themselves, a Constantinian arrangement might have been at work. Missionary expansion and colonizing efforts were oftentimes not critically, critically distinguished. And in cases in which political and religious authorities sanctioned violence and oppression, we have but one more manifestation of the Constantinian legacy. If this is a rough account of what Constantinian, Constantinianism is, what is its legacy for us today? This is a hard topic to broach because a discussion of this kind plays into 
the polarization that this country emits time and time again, most recently, of course, with the presidential election. The Constantinian legacy that I wish to expose that has potentially its hold on us today is the subtle ways that being American and being Christian are easily conflated in the eyes of many. And there are plenty of examples for this. Matters oftentimes come up, especially when they have to do with construals of patriotism that occasion the manifestation of Constantinianism. If you're having trouble thinking of some examples, how about the wording of the Pledge of Allegiance, the Ten Commandments placed in courthouses, justifications for war, justifications for a particular candidate or political party or particular policy, the way the American flag is considered and displayed, our currency, the way other religions besides Christianity are talked about, and on and on and on. These many scenarios with real life circumstances and cases to back them up raises an important question. What is the difference between being an American and being a Christian? Now, plenty of forces exist to make that question difficult for some to answer. And if so, I would argue that that is in itself a Constantinian legacy. This legacy assumes that political power and the mandate of God are intertwined. This legacy assumes that Christianity is anything but a minority in the public square. And ultimately, this legacy compromises the church's ability to be critical of the state. So should there be differences between being an American and being a Christian? Well, I would say absolutely. But given certain arrangements, certain factions, certain constructions of power and identity, the question itself, interestingly enough, can be unsettling and controversial. I would imagine that for those of us in this room who are not Westerners and, or who are not Christians, uh, such difficulty in answering such an obvious question might simply be mind-boggling to you. But the difficulty is there for many nonetheless, and at choice moments in our public lives, the issue comes up. So why am I raising this point? In large part, I raise it because I don't think that we as Western Christians can truly be Christ's global body without a critical engagement of our Constantinian legacy. Constantinianism funds a kind of exceptionalism that is anti-Christian. Constantinianism blurs national identity and Christian identity in ways that strengthen the former and diminish the latter in unhelpful ways. Back to our main orienting claims, Constantinianism contributes to a conception of our agency and a conception of alterity of self and world that raises us up potentially and potentially brings others down. The Constantinian legacy does not help us deal with non-Westerners well. The Constantinian legacy does not help us deal with non-Christians well. The Constantinian legacy does not help us deal with ourselves well. After all, given the convergence of power at work, do, uh, how easily does a Constantinian legacy lend itself to the admission of limits and to the confession of sins and to the plea for forgiveness? I would say not well at all. So what are we to do with this legacy? I would hope that the first step would be to simply acknowledge it. That sounds obvious, right? Well, frankly, not so much. So let me give you a personal example. I was recently reading something that jolted me quite a bit uh, that had me reflect about my experience in high school. That's me in high school. <laughs> now, I remember quite vividly spending time in high school reflecting on the Holocaust in my classes. And we read about it, we talked about it, we saw Schindler's List, and so on. And it was a troubling topic to be sure, but it also felt distant and far off. It makes good sense to study the Holocaust. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that, it's very important. But here's another part of the story that you should know. I went to high school in Tennessee. <laughs> and Tennessee is the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. And yet never, let me repeat, never did we ever talk about lynching in our states and regions history with that practice in particular. And to just add further to the irony, 
the hip-hop group Arrested Development was popular at the time that I was in high school. And they came out with a hit song that talked about lynching. Does anybody know what the name of their popular song is? Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm laughing because it's awful, right? It's awful that there are plenty of indicators there to reconcile with this story, to think about this history, to think about this legacy. It's prominent in people's consciousness. People are singing the song, Tennessee, Tennessee. And it never was talked about, uh, this, this, this tradition, this legacy of lynching in, in the state of Tennessee. And it's, 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 when I made that realization recently, it just it struck me of how... Uh, how the obvious of oftentimes is not obvious. Right. Unmasking or unearthing difficult topics, as obvious as they are to some, is very difficult for those closest to the situation. And I think something analogous is at work potentially with unmasking or unearthing Constantinianism. So as an exercise to move us toward this, uh, let's recall the title of this lecture, The World is our parish. Wesley, interestingly, had quite a bit of problems with the changes that took place as signified by Constantine's reign. And yet his conception of the self and of the world in the quote, the world is my parish, which casts the self as having a kind of agency by a divine minded mandate to reach into and shape the world is, like I said, not innocuous. Left unchecked, such a posture could operate out of and invite Constantinian dynamics. Is there another way to think of this phrase? I think the, there is, and here is an alternative. First, notice how I've changed in my title for this lecture the personal and possessive pronoun at work. I shifted from my to our. That's an intentional shift so as to allow for a sense of collective identity. The world is not simply my parish, the world is our parish. I'm hoping through this shift to oper operationalize some sense of the way the self is itself constituted and shaped by wider communal forces. Which leads me to a second point. The claim that the world is our parish can be understood in a sense to be precisely that, as a kind of claiming. What I'm pushing for here is not so much a self on the one hand and the world on the other. What I'm aiming for in this sense is a sense that these self and world can be understood as overlapping realities. You see the difference? Not self over against the world, but the self very much mixed in the world. The self finding itself in and recognizing its home as the world. I think it is quite important to say in a constant, in the context uh, in which Constantinian legacies are at work, that we are world. We are world. Now, I know that Christians may be hung up a little bit with the language of world here because some, including myself, in terms of how I was raised, have associated the world with worldliness, that which is opposed to the church. And sometimes this is called the church world dichotomy, but I'm not speaking of world in such a way. Rather, I'm speaking of world in the sense of our earthly, creaturely, global reality. The claim we are world involves a recognition that we are conditioned before we condition. We are shaped before we shape. We come out of the passive voice before engaging in the active voice. When we go on to add the notion of parish, now we have an explicitly theological dynamic to account for as well. Now aggregated to the claim we are world, we who are Christians can say, and this world is our parish. Western Christians claiming we are world and the world is our parish is a pretty significant move in the sense I'm trying to describe. In saying this, Western Christians are essentially confessing our context in which we worship, the sense of belonging we have to a faith community has worldly dimensions. We are called to be in solidarity with a global reality. We are a global parish. I'm hoping that the phrase is starting to sound a little different now. The world is our parish. 
At least I'm hoping some light bulbs are going off. And if not, hang in there. Stay with me. Let's try it again. It, it is not that we alter the world. It is that we are part of the world. It's not that we say something like, let's change or preach to the world, as we say, the world is a place where we are changed and where we hear the gospel preached. It is where we start from. It's not to say that the world involves people other than us. No, in this sense, the world is us, our people. We are world. To move in ecclesial terms, it is not to say the church in Africa or the church in Asia or the church in America. The move is to say our church, the church to which we belong. We. What I'm striving after in this back and forth recalibration of the phrase the world is our parish is what can be termed Catholicity. People have a number of different connotations when they hear the word Catholicity or most likely Catholic. Sometimes people associate it primarily with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that's not the definition in particular that I I'm, I'm have in mind here when I'm saying Catholicity. Uh, another way of thinking of the word is that it's a syn synonym with universal, or Catholicity with universality. So for instance, in my church when we recite the Apostles' Creed, uh, we have there at the very bottom, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, there's always an asterisk there now, and it says, or universal, just to be sure, just so that good Protestants, non-Catholics are sure this word is tame, right? <laughs> The word in its Greek roots means according to the whole, kataholes. Therefore, these connotations are on the table for us. Universal, one true church, and according to the whole. When we as Western Christians confess that we are part of the Catholic Church, we are making, in a sense, an anti-Constantinian confession. At its basic level, Catholicity is an enemy of Constantinianism. So I have the verses there. I wish to argue that you cannot have one without complication and tension with the other. A Constantinian church, as we have defined the term, cannot be a Catholic church, as I'm working to define that term now. What I'm trying to offer here is an account of Catholicity that can relate to the reality where the term is used in the New Testament. For instance, Acts 9.31. And here we have an aside by the author after making some reports on Paul, or Saul, as he's called at this point. Meanwhile, the church, and in the NRSV, it's translated throughout, and this is the construction, uh, according to the whole, quite literally. Meanwhile, the church uh, throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up. Living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Now think about the tensions in Scripture in reference to Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Think about Nathaniel's question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And remember that Nazareth is in Galilee. Or think of the conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman at the well, and we get another aside, this one with the words, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. The claim in the book of Acts that the church, according to the whole of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, had peace and was built up, is in strong contrast to some of the rivalries hinted at in other parts of Scripture. For Western Christians to claim the world is our parish in a non-Constantinian way involves, at least in part, the self-understanding that the claim is one of identification and solidarity rather than of difference and exceptionality. There's a Christological rift that can be applied and drawn out here. The incarnation itself is an act of identification and solidarity that all too often is neglected by Western Christians in light of their fixation on the cross and it's Constantinian domestication. But once again, Christ made this world his own. As Christians baptized into the life of Christ, we were called to make this world our own as well, not in the sense of possessing, but in the sense of locating and understanding ourselves. But here we have another dynamic of Catholicity that I wish to press, and that too can have a Christological riff, and that would be of divestment. Catholicity not only involves identification and solidarity, but also includes some sense of giving up or renunciation. To confess 
the world as our parish in the manner that I'm describing here may mean that we give up or divest ourselves of any number of things. When theologians think of such a notion Christologically, they often appeal to Philippians 2 and to the language of kenosis, uh, which can be understood as emptying. And it's highlighted there in the passage. Let the same mind be in you that was Christ Jesus, that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard the quality of God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Uh, taking on the form of a slave or servant, being born in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now the difficulty here is this might sound strictly as a renunciation of power, which stresses an active form of agency once more. To a Constantinian sensibility, the language of kenosis, of emptying or divestment may sound like charity or pro bono work. They may do for any number of reasons, including maybe even self-serving reasons. But with this passage, I want to stress the interconnectivity between emptying and death. The emptying or divestment is but one feature toward death. And if we press through, as Paul does, uh, to a kind of transformation after death. I said earlier that we have to worry about assumptions that are not necessarily chastened by the crucifying and transformative power of the gospel itself. Now, of course, I mean more than worry. <laughs> The subtitle of this lecture involves the language of struggle, struggling with Catholicity. The power secured by Constantinianism is not the power available with Catholicity. We are back to the great Pauline language of the foolishness of the cross. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If we had to generalize quite broadly, the temptation of Constantinianism that is capitulated to time and time again. The reason why it changes and alters and mutates over the centuries and yet is still alive with us today is because it is a temptation to secure a certain kind of power that Westerners have a hard time resisting when it's presented to them. And so here's the sum of the matter. To be global Christians, to, able, to be able to claim the world as our parish in a non constantinian way, we have to be disposed to the possibility of being, note the passive sense, of being disempowered and destabilized. And this, I believe, is the only true path to transformation, to being Christ-like. It's actually a lesson I have learned more and more from some Reformed and Presbyterian friends, shout out. Uh, in my own life, uh, others too, but those are the ones that have been helping me lately. The power of transformation, the path toward being deconstantinianized, is the path of humility. It's the path of confession, the path of seeking forgiveness and forgiving, the path of remembrance, and the path of repair, the path of admitting ignorance, the path of recognizing motives and impact, the path of acknowledging pain, the path of listening, the path of patience, the path of long suffering, in short, the path of the cross. These don't sound like Constantinian themes. And I don't care about a, apocalyptic prognoses, prognoses of the state of Christianity in the West being so awful. You know, I hinted at that a little bit earlier. I don't think the Christian church in the West will die but it certainly is being pressured in varying ways. And some of the ways, these ways actually not altogether bad. But my aim this evening is that when you hear a claim like the world is our parish, or even engaging the culture, changing the world, that the modality out of which you engage such phrases is not so much a Constantinian one, but a Catholic one. So that we Western Christians can truly confess and actively participate in the universal, worldly, Catholic Church. Thank you.
Jen's coming around, Pat. I'll just break it all up. Um, Daniel, thank you for your excellent talk and for the excellent challenge and an honest challenge. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'll just start with a softball. What's the hardest habit of Constantinianism to break? Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the hardest is, is the exceptionalism that comes with it. Uh, my dad is a Mexican, and every time we would watch the World Series together, he would say, why is this thing called the World Series? I mean, he would get so mad uh, about it, and, and, I, and I came to agree to the point. You're right, Dad. These are, not, these are not world teams. It's not a World Series. That's right. It's not. And he would just get real uh, animated about it. And that happened every year he watched it. You know, I, I got it. And, uh, you know, when we, when we claim as Americans to, to be the best, we have the strongest military presence in the world, we have the best athletes, we have the greatest show on earth, uh, we, have, we have this sense of, of self-understanding that I'm just raising the question, how, how does that play into Christian commitments? It has to, somehow. And um, so at least uh, my, my, my lecture is somewhat of a softball in itself. I'm just wanting us to talk about and recognize that we do that. Um, and that's very hard at times to do. I don't know if you noticed the controversy with President Trump when he said, and God bless him, after he was explaining the Syrian bombings, he said, God bless America and the world. And there was some chatter. Oh, he added that and the world? It's still a Constantinian move, but it is a gesture that's different than previous administrations, right? So uh, the exceptionalism, I think, is part of the part of the problem, because I think it feeds into perhaps a Christian exceptionalism. Thanks, Shannon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, great talk. Um, I guess two parts. On, on one side, I'm curious, your discussion of a Western Christianity. How much can we really speak of a Western Christianity? Mm -hmm. I mean, when I hear about Constantinianism, I think, I mean, what comes to mind is the papism I think the Byzantine tradition, I think the Orthodox. And then I think, well, there's a very strong difference between the Orthodox, the Catholic, and the Protestant. Yeah. Um, so how much can we really think about a unified Western tradition in the sense, at the same time, looking at remedies for that approach? Um, what do we have to do to basically avoid something resembling, I mean, almost a neo-Orientalist or, or, I mean, Rousseauian noble savage, or basically the idea of, well, okay, we're going we're gonna to criticize the West here, but avoiding the sort of, the, 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 the sort of childish idealization, uh, where we're basically not treating others as interlocutors, yeah. but, but as, the, as the ultimate source of truth. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, I think those points are, are related in some sense. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned in a previous context this year that um, after the presidential elections, I, I've, I've become even more so a proponent of the liberal arts. Right? And the reason why is because I, as an educator in this context, I think this is one of the places that I really believe we can nuance. And our world is desperate of nuance, right? And so there, there is some problems at some level talking about Western Christianity. There, there, there are some problems talking about how um, the other uh, might be exoticized somehow. And I think those are worth uh, pushing in terms of nuancing, in terms of qualification and so forth. Um, my worry sometimes with that nuancing is that it potentially gets us off the hook somehow. If we can maybe bring in other details to sidetrack or to, uh, to misdirect our focus, but absolutely, I would say that um, for purposes of, of this talk, these in some levels worked as heuristic devices, especially the Western category, uh, but that has to be problematized as well, absolutely. Because if they are not in the long term, those could become problems themselves too. Yes. Jen. Thank you, Daniel. I was wondering if you'd be willing to um, take this idea of the Constantinianism within our collective church imagination in the North American context and um, help us think more broadly about other ways that this may be operating within um, our collective way of thinking about what it means to be church. And then possibly if you could think with us on what, how we think about um, the, the way that um, the church um, in other parts of the world has been the inheritors of those same maybe Constantinian ways of thinking within 
the church community and what, what to do about addressing challenges can, like that. Can you repeat the first question differently? Um, the first question has to do with thinking about the way the Constantinian imagination um, works in maybe other dynamics of the way that we are church or do church or say who is part of the church. Mm -hmm. In other dynamics. Well, I think part of the, of, um, of the challenge that I find at times is the way that, for instance, Christianity is deeply polarized in this country in terms of conservatives and liberals. And again, how those kinds of interactions and the way those, those lines are formed, those parties, uh, collective consciousness are, are formed. It, it has a way of, of again, um, misdirecting attention uh, or, or allowing the focus to be on those, for instance, hot topic issues or something to that effect rather than other things, right? I mean, it's very hard and all of the distraction and all the chatter uh, to, to be a global church, perhaps when we're too busy trying to alienate one another in terms of some of these matters. And so I think just the just the, the tendency that we have oftentimes to have uh, local rivalries is a, is a kind of, uh, is reflective of this lack of consciousness, right? That, that can absorb our attention uh, and we can make these adjudications as to who and who is not part of the church across the street, etc. And of course, in terms of your second question, uh, a significant worry is, is pre precisely how um, uh, the way that the, the global church is talked about, it's talked about as young, it's talked about as poor, and the sense that we are to train ourselves and send folks out to educate, right? And so those, those encounters in which people um, say they want to help others develop contextual theologies, but in a sense they replicate the theologies that they'd already heard uh, in their preparation, I think that's another indicator of this precisely, and that is that, you know, um, as, as you go on to reflect on the Christian faith uh, with others, uh, just how strong of a voice do they have in the kinds of metaphors they choose or how they elaborate things, that's been a tension as well. Theological education. Yeah. So do you have any suggestions for how we might revise the SPU <laughs> motto? <laughs> towards Catholicity. <laughs> yeah, if anybody doesn't know, I was referencing April uh, when I said a colleague at an in-service. She, she made that remark, uh, which I thought was very appropriate, very helpful. Well, no, I'm not a consultant for branding and never will be, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I know my place at least at that level, right? I know I'm not going to be uh, tapped for that role, per se. Um, You know, it's interesting, talking to students, um, just to be honest with how it's been picked up, I, I've talked to students who said that was an initial attraction, right? That this was actually a, uh, something that, that piqued their interest. And yet, over the course of the education, uh, there might be a fallout, right? In terms, well, uh, there, there are problems with it, right? And I don't know, I, I, I guess that I would say that um, as, as appealing as it is, I, I always tend towards, uh, for something like that, something a bit more modest or a bit more constrained. Uh, something, something in terms that involves, from our end, pain. <laughs> uh, and self-giving, somehow, right? Uh, that, that's, I think, a, a healthy way to go at it. Uh, so, die, let's see. Um, Listening to the to the culture and dying to the world, something to that, to that effect. Yeah, that, those would be my suggestions. Uh, uh, Daniel, thanks again. Um, the C I was waiting for was capitalism. Yeah, that's and a nice I, and one. I was, yeah. And, um, and, I, and maybe it was embedded in Constantinianism and your implications, but I wanted to tease it out maybe a little bit with this question. Is that I, I feel like the binary of Constantinianism and you know, the Catholicity aspect 
I feel like those are still abstracted. Okay. Um, they can be idealized, they okay. can be abstracted. That's right. We can go home, we can kind of muse about them. Yeah. But, but capitalism is gritty, it's real, it's material. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it is the ism that lives and breathes. Okay. Um, okay. And, and so I'm wondering in your, your kind of push to move us towards that, you know, is something in this kind of the need to continue to create capital, to maintain capital as a moral responsibility of what it means to be a faithful disciple, this holdover of Protestantism, this drive, is that perhaps what we need to temper or need to move into our sense of kenosis? And, and what's ringing in my head as I was listening to your talk, is, and this is, marks my vintage, I guess, is the 1963 Morris West novel, The Shoes of the Fisherman, um, which is this parable of uh, the Vatican being asked to mediate the coming of World War III. It's very much a 60s era novel. And uh, you know, the, the great ending of the novel is when the Vatican decides to divest all of its property, all of its holding, to feed the poor. Um, and it stops the war by doing so. And it is truly a fable, but it played very well in the age of Aquarius of the 60s. Um, but I'm wondering, that radical move um, that makes a statement that totally is a divestment of power and really divestment of capital. Is our need to hold on to capital, our fear of scarcity, our fear of position, is that perhaps really the, the C that's hiding behind all of this? I think it's a significant one, and I actually flirted with the idea of possibly bringing that into the conversation too, but, um, you know, you, you could argue that was maybe one that really needed to be highlighted, and, and I agree. Um, because with that one, um, there is this, this influence in terms of our agency and in terms of our desire. That's really, in terms of capitalism, what I really worry about is the, the way that our desires are deformed as a result, right? Um, that somehow that, um, it, it becomes all consuming and, and, and there's, there's oftentimes a loss of critical um, reaction to capitalism, again, maybe because of the dyads that perpetu are perpetuated. Well, if you're not uh, pro-capitalism, then you're something else that we definitely don't like and so forth. But yeah, it's interesting, right, uh, the way that this, this plays out. So uh, I'm not an expert on these matters at all, but I'm, I'm just remembering of how, uh, you know, Christopher Columbus, I mentioned colonialism, Christopher Columbus in terms of of the way that he would write in his journal about, you know, looking for gold, finding gold, and so forth. And there's a sense, ultimately, that he was looking that by, by getting all these resources, it was a way of, of if, if the king and queen promise, uh, whatever I find, that that will fund an expedition to reclaim Jerusalem, right? And so, again, we have this sense of, uh, well, the, the desire for money is not bad as long as you want to do something good with it. Well, that's precisely, I would say, another feature of this. And, um, but that, that's, that's certainly a very hard one to just have a conversation uh, about in terms of, of how we are warped, I would use that language, warped very much by, by the market. State the market, typically, right, in terms of how we uh, are shaped in our desires and expectations and what funds. Uh, our sense of significance and happiness. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. We have time for one more question. Rod's here. <laughs> Wondering. What if I have two questions? <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel, thank you very much for a really wonderful and challenging talk. <clears throat> Um, and thank you for the emphasis on, uh, on nuance, looking for it, being aware of it, having, being conscious of that the analysis or the problem is always more complex than we think it is. Yes. So with that, how would you suggest two things that I worry about uh, historically, historical things, how do we avoid sort of fantasizing about the pre about the anti Nicene era, yeah. the pre Constantinian era? Like it was some, it was doctrinally doctrinally pure. They figured out the canon and all that stuff, yeah. and then so how do we avoid that? Because that would neglect the contributions that came further, and we might lose sight of the fact that 
every one of the ecumenical councils was convened by an emperor. And do we want to dismiss all the good fruit that came from those? And then the other problem is that I worry about is thinking of all the men and women who literally gave up their lives in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries to be missionaries in the classic sense of the word. Yeah. And like, they didn't go down to the recruiting center and say, hey, I want to serve the empire. Sign me up as a missionary. And so I don't, who's, who's owning whom in that picture? And, and being careful not to over simplify the critique of colon colonialism yes. in the sense that all of the heartfelt, deep, you know, um, self-emptying emptying work that good people mm -hmm. did. You know, despite the fact that there's always errors and missteps and stub toes, mm -hmm. good. unforeseen consequences. Yeah, good. Well, in terms of the first question about um, how do we not romanticize the anti-Nicene, anti-A-N-T-E, right. right, not A-N-T-I, uh, the, this period before Nicaea, I think it's just, uh, again, not... Um, not generating strong opinions based on just hearsay. I mean, you look at uh, that work, the Apostolic Fathers, uh, right, the, the work of early literature. Anti-Semitism is very strong, very early in the history of the Christian church, right? It's very startling how quickly this is registered publicly, right? And, um, and you can attribute any number of things to it, but uh, as I recall, within the second century, it is palpable in some, some writings and it's problematic, significantly problematic. So um, uh, you've, you've got all kinds of, 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 of instabilities. Um, so the rise of, of, of a canon of scripture is helpful. That, that's part of the Nicene era, right? Uh, and uh, all kinds of other factors. So I think Here's the, here's the thing that I would say. Any time that we are glorifying one era or demonizing another era, we got to go deeper, right? Uh, because uh, it's just too complex as a result. And I have to say that in preparing for this lecture, I really had to come to terms with some of my own problems because one of the fun things to do in the training that I received was to bash Constantine, right? And so as I prepared for this lecture and read up more and more in his life, I realized this, 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 is, this guy is very, I made mean, it a point, he's very complex. I mean, he's, he's, he adopted some of the grammar. He adopted some of the language. Um, there's something to be said for that. He, his reasoning uh, operated out of some Christian commitments. That's significant, right? In terms of the second part, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was raised in Mexico, uh, and so sometimes, Christian missionaries would come from, from the U.S. to my house, and uh, it was very funny sometimes because uh, my parents couldn't do everything, so sometimes little Danny would have to translate for these folks, right? So I'm like five or six years old telling people, this is how you say, where the, where's the bathroom? You know, and it was, just, it was really fun because uh, uh, I didn't notice it at the time. I just thought, all right, so I have to explain to these folks what this is. But it is a kind of power dynamic there, right? You've got a five-year-old teaching a 35-year-old with a, with a doctorate degree or master's degree who's coming to be a teacher, you know, how to do some very basic things. Um, and uh, I say that uh, to, to illustrate the point that um, good motives are, are not enough, right? And so uh, the call to, to, um, to spread the gospel at great personal sacrifice at times, I, that's a kind of commitment that, uh, that, that it's hard for me to imagine because you know, people die in, in, in committing this way. And yet um, there has to be a critical nature to that as well. As we, as we evaluate those folks, I would hope as those folks evaluate their own lives, of, well, what's, what's actually motivating me, right? And what is it that I'm wanting to do? And, and the critique is to be rendered, to be uh, given for, for the sake of the gospel, right? Because good intentions are not enough when it's involving uh, damaging people's um, sense of faith being a certain way or whatnot. So it's, it's a sense in which I, I want to honor folks. I mentioned Sister Maria. I, I want to honor folks who, who've committed uh, in ways that I, I have a hard time understanding, and yet, out of a love for folks like her, 
to register these kinds of concerns as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're at the fun part because I get to, um, to thank Daniel very much for tonight's lecture, which I know we all enjoyed, and to present to you with an honorarium, which isn't actually in this envelope. <laughs> but it's a letter that tells you you're gonna get an honorarium in your paycheck. So thank you for that. Um, and the very best part, something that all faculty covet, but only a few get to wear, the Weeder Medallion. Uh, any other Weeder medals? Academic bling, as, as Mike Langford said once. That's right, the bling. Uh, so I'm going to present you with that right now. You'll be able to wear that with your academic regalia or just around the house, you know, when you're feeling fancy. So um, I'd like to just adjourn us now. We have some refreshments out in the foyer. Thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>